Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today as we commemorate the life of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. What a wonderful message. Thank you. The speaker is pleased to introduce students from the Institute for Community Leadership who are here to, to speak on the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. The Institute for Community Leadership conducts classes and out-of-school programs featuring civic engagements and social responsibility as a means of fortifying academic excellence and school and community problem solving. They are in Olympia today to commemorate the contributions of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. and will share their insights on Dr. King's work and constructive, inclusive civil society. Please join me in welcoming Isaac Sotolorn Gonzalez, a senior at Kentwood High School, Zinta Ahmed, senior at Kent Meridian High School, and Rebecca Gaia, junior at Kentwood High School. Please join me. Good morning. Thank you for the work you do for this state's families, schools, and students. Thank you for making it through the sacrifices that leadership brings upon you and your families. It is a great day to honor Dr. King. This year, we commemorate the 50th anniversary of his assassination. A conundrum confronts America. Our nation is divided along race and cultural barriers. Young people and adults alike face many difficulties. Addiction to cell phones has become a problem. Bullying hampers education in our schools. Drugs corrode the work ethic. Many have gone from polite to impolite and rude. We are becoming deaf to each other's words. The people yearn for hope and dreams. Dr. King says, the shape of the world today does not permit us a faltering democracy. America is of, for, and by the people. Together, we are better. Thank you. times, our light must shine brighter. We must see more clearly and act upon our values and democratic principles. The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience but where he stands in times of challenge and controversy. Dr. King calls us to create community. We are all interconnected. It really boils down to this, that all life is interrelated. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. This is the interrelated structure 
of all reality. We as young people honor and respect the privilege and responsibility of solving complex problems for the people of the state of Washington. We have faith in you. We know that you will use your collective intelligence and compassion as you move through this year's legislative session. Thank you. One of the great difficulties facing us today is the darkness of despair. Many of us feel like we do not matter. We feel that our voice does not matter. When an individual is no longer a true participant, when he no longer feels a sense of responsibility to his society, the content of democracy is emptied. The essence of our nation requires us to grapple with and solve this great deficit in citizenship and civic responsibility. It begins with each individual. We must change ourselves first before we can help change others. Dr. King says, one of the sure signs of maturity is the ability to rise to the point of self-criticism. We all have to learn how to get out of our comfort zones. We must learn how to lessen our defensiveness develop self-control and discipline. Dr. King Day is a great day to try this, to get out of our comfort zones, to sit somewhere where we won't normally sit, to follow our tasks. An example of this is in high school, the most segregated place is in the lunchrooms. We always tend to sit with our friends or with people we look alike. But we never try to sit with somebody new or somebody we don't know. Let's try to change that. As we go forward into 2018, may knowledge and wisdom be our tools to construct stronger bonds of friendship. May we apply compassion and respect to form a stronger democracy. Thank you. The speaker would typically say wow, but I will not say wow. Thank you, Isaac, <laughs> Zinta. Thank you, Isaac, Zinta, and Rebecca for your participation today. The speaker is pleased to introduce students from the Institute for Community Leadership who are with us today. Will they please stand in the South Gallery and be recognized?
With the consent of the House, the minutes of the preceding day will stand approved. Hear no objection, so ordered. House Resolution 4653, honoring the life of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. The clerk will read. Whereas today, the third Monday of January 2018, we join with the nation to honor the monumental life and profound legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And whereas Dr. King began and inspired a social justice movement alongside his wife, Coretta Scott King, and his four children, and whereas he dedicated his life's work to gain civil and economic rights for all, with his selfless work reminding us that life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? And whereas we should be reminded that even when Dr. King received a C in his public speaking class, he did not let that singular rating determine his ability to inspire one person, let alone a nation, saying, no person has the right to reign on your dreams. And whereas 44 years ago, he marched on Washington, D.C., sharing his dream that one day, little black boys and girls will be holding hands with little white boys and girls. And whereas we remember his letter to Birmingham, which includes the words, nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and establish such creative tension that a community that has consistently refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. And whereas people around the world still use his nonviolent philosophy as a guide to making lasting changes, following the words of Dr. King, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And whereas we honor the many achievements Dr. King accumulated in recognition of his search for justice, including the Nobel Prize for Peace in 1964, the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1977, and the Congressional Gold Medal in 2004, now, therefore, be it resolved that the House of Representatives recognize the importance of the life of Dr. King, exalt his dedicated work, and embrace the ideals of equality and e equity for all people. The gentleman from the 46th District, Representative Valdez. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move adoption of the resolution. It has been moved and seconded that a res House Resolution 4653 be adopted. Representative Valdez. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you the, for the chance to speak, and thank you for presiding today as we celebrate the life of a man who inspired so many. The life and work of Dr. King is worth remembering, not simply because he had the courage to stand up against injustice, but he also had the courage and the ability to inspire a divided nation. His words and his deeds are important because there are always forces trying to divide us. The only question is, what is our response to those seeking to promote fear and division? Well, I believe that Dr. King showed us how. He taught us to confront violence with nonviolence. He battled police dogs and fire hoses with peaceful sit-ins and protest marches. He showed us how to battle division with unity, a message, a message we had just heard here a few minutes ago. And the best weapon to use against hate is the power of love and the power of forgiveness. And perhaps most importantly, Dr. King understood that the path to true progress comes from protecting our democracy and that sacred right to vote. So this day isn't a dry history lesson. History is still being written today. He wouldn't sit quietly if people were banned from our country simply because of their religion. He wouldn't ignore voter suppression and gerrymandering in other states that disenfranchise the working poor and people of color. And myself, as a first generation Mexican American, I would like to believe that Dr. King would ask us to embrace our differences because they make us stronger. He would strengthen and enrich our right to vote as the cornerstone of our democracy and our freedoms. And I hope today that we can remember Dr. King's life and his work, not only today, but every day 
during this legislative session. And I hope we can embrace our differences to listen to each other as we work in common purpose for the common good. I hope. And a big part of the reason that I have hope is because Dr. King showed me how. Further remarks? The gentleman from the 19th District Representative Walsh. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, today we gather to honor Martin Luther King Jr. And there's much we could say, but I thought uh, it might be appropriate to actually read some of his own words from one of his early sermons. Can I have permission to read an excerpt from one of his sermons? Please continue. Uh, this is from uh, the King sermon entitled Man's Sin and God's Grace. It was delivered in the late 1950s before King had reached national prominence, but I think it reflects the philosophy that carried him forward into the work that he did uh, in later years. Man is a sinner. That is one of the basic facts of the universe and one of the basic facts of life. Now we've tried to get away from this in the modern world. We hate this word, sin. We run from it. We try to talk about it in other terms. This is one of the weaknesses of religious liberalism that in throwing out certain traditional concepts, which it should have thrown out, liberalism fell then to the danger for, uh, that forever confronts any new view. It became sentimental and soft, feeling that man was evolving from a lower state to a higher state, and eventually he would throw off all the evils and sin in his nature. But even after all that, man is still a sinner. We face the new psychology it furnishes us with a lot of words and phrases to explain certain weaknesses in human nature. So we very easily dismiss the word sin, and we start talking about phobias and inhibitions, and we reach over to Freudian psychology and say it's a conflict between the id and the superego. But when man's through talking in terms of all this bombastic phrasing, he discovers that he is still a sinner. Sin grows even worse when we go out into the social dimensions of it, when we pass from the personal to the social. That's when sin becomes really tragic. You know, individuals devoid of society are much more moral, much more rational, and much more good than society itself. But it's because man is caught in society that he becomes an even greater sinner. It's very seldom that a man by himself will lynch anybody, but a mob will lynch somebody. That is why one theologian can write a book entitled Moral Man, an Immoral Society. The real tragedy of man's social and collective existence is the fact that sin is almost inescapable in it. I was talking with a man the other night who was saying to me that he refused to pay income taxes because the nation uses such taxes for wars. And I was sympathetic to his view. But I said to him, you haven't solved the problem because by refusing to pay income tax, you are just putting greater tax burdens on your brother. And you cannot refuse to pay taxes because you drove your car down here from Ohio and you had to buy gas. And every time you bought gas, you were paying some taxes on that gas. And you were helping to support war even while you bought gas. This is the tragedy of collective and social life, that man never gets out of sin because he's caught in society. If we stop there, I assure you, we would be in a pretty tragic predicament. That man's life would be a life of nothingness, a life of endless pessimism. So we can't stop there. And that's something of the beauty of the Christian faith. It says that in the midst of man's tragic predicament, in the midst of his awful inclination towards sin, God has come into the picture and done something about it. It says that standing over and against the tragic dimensions of man's sin is the glorious dimension of God's grace. 
God's grace stands over man's sin. Grace is not just some passing phrase, not just some old concept that we should be ashamed to use now. It has a very vital place in understanding the whole predicament of man, the whole predicament of the universe. For you can never understand life until you understand the meaning of grace. It's a gift that we don't merit, that we don't deserve, but we so desperately need. That's grace, and none of us could live without it. A great sermon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The lady from the 30th District Representative Reeves. Today, my thoughts are with the millions of people who put their faith in us to lead. Over the past few years, people in this country have disconnected from one another. Families and friends are no longer speaking. Neighbors have disengaged from their communities. Letting divisive politics overrule love, shared values, and a faith in the system. Dr. King warned against losing faith or falling away from the fight for justice. He said, this is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. However, for many, acceptance of the broken system and a feeling that we can do nothing to change it has become the status quo. All across Washington, moms and dads are just trying to provide for their families, to build and keep a home, to feed and clothe their children, to invest in their future. You see, that's the American dream. And it's a good dream. But for far too many, it's just that, a dream. And that dream is fading away as too many of us are becoming paralyzed by what's happening in American politics today. I've known that feeling. We've started to lose hope to lose faith in our leaders. Uninspired by the rhetoric, unimpressed by governing that puts partisanship over solving people's problems. I came to Olympia thinking that education was the top priority. And it is, along with every other priority. To be honest, it's a little overwhelming. <clears throat> to see the level of need in our state and the problems that we need to solve. Families looking to leave longtime homes due to increased growth and higher costs. Working parents feeling their budgets broken over the increased cost of childcare. Small businesses looking for tax relief from a system that favors big corporations. Dr. King said, it is not where you stand in moments of comfort and convenience, but where you stand in moments of challenge and controversy. There are a dozen reasons that I could think of to stay home, to be with my family, to focus on my tiny corner of the world, there are millions of people in this state looking to us to stand up for them, to put problem solving before partisanship, to work across the aisle, to do what's right, even when it's hard, to return their faith in our democracy. I'm constantly reminded how important it is especially in this place, that people have the opportunity to engage their government, to take social action on issues like health care, homelessness, the environment, and equal pay, and contributing to an economy that works for everyone. 
Dr. King showed us how to take action, to enact change. He showed us that civic engagement could change hearts and minds, that participation in the process can actually save lives. Whether it's standing up to the elite and saying enough is enough, or volunteering in your local soup kitchen to feed the hungry, every day, the people of Washington are looking to their lawmakers to help make their life a little easier, a little better for all working families. I came to Olympia to do the hard work, to get things done for real people. And I remember as a little girl, the words of Dr. King. And so I've come to the people's house to prove that change is possible that good policy can come from good lawmakers. If we keep our faith in ourselves and each other, and we remember his lesson, not to sit on the sidelines or give in to gradualism. gradualism. That's why I'm standing up today for families like mine, like yours, who just want that shot at the American dream. Thank you. The gentleman from the 20th District Representative, DeBolt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to support this resolution today. And it's interesting because I've been on this floor for 22 years. And I've always wanted to speak on this resolution and never have. And um, before I get started, I just want to take a moment to thank those great young speakers that started our morning off because you really reminded us that you give hope to us and you remind us that apathy is not alive in our state and in our high schools and that activism is still alive. So thank you very much for that. Um, as we talk about this today, I've heard, we heard a sermon, we heard some personal experiences, we heard some truths. I want to talk about a little 10-year-old kid who had a paper route in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, me. And my mom, who was the first EEO in a small southern town, home of the Jefferson Davis Memorial, who was fighting to segregate schools, and we moved there. And we came from the West, and the culture was sharply different for me. Um, couple of parts of the story that are interesting. As soon as we arrived in town and my mom accepted her position with the, and they were appointed back then by the Carter administration. She was a Carter Democrat. And we went and we started going, she started going into the elections and she started looking at the jobs and the hirings. And it wasn't soon after that, that they had a school board meeting and they redistricted me to Booker T. Washington Elementary School. And there, was a total different world than Holiday, which I had originally enrolled in. Booker T. Washington was, and I, I'm going to put it plainly, I was only one of two white children in the entire school. And they thought they were doing me some unfavor to my mom by sending me there. But they didn't. They taught me so much. And they put me here today because of that action. And my mom was one of these people that believe that Dr. King, and I'm gonna use the quote that she talked about when I was a child, may I quote from Dr. King? Please continue. I refuse to accept the view that mankind is so tragically bound to the starlit midnight of racism and war that the daybreak of peace and brotherhood can never become reality. I believed that the unarmed truth and unconditional love will be the final word. What that meant to our family and what that meant to me is that you can overcome anything with love. You can overcome any barrier, any injustice with peace. You know, we look at it today, it's so easy to get into your Facebook echo chamber and listen to only people that agree with you. And then you become more vitriolic and more hateful on all these echo chambers that exist today. That's not what we were shooting for. So when my mom 
explained to me one day why there was a cross burning in our front yard during a, the Jefferson Davis's birthday. I didn't understand. But she said, it's okay. These people are misguided and they don't understand that love is the right thing. Okay. So I head out on my paper route one morning and instead of going my normal route, I cut through the back and in the south, in the old neighborhoods, there's a row of houses that are on the alley. And there was an older gentleman there, and his name was Shorty. And he was all of 5'3", he was missing his left arm, and he was missing his right eye. And he asked me one day, it was really hot, I had all 116 papers in my bag if I wanted a soda. So I sat on the deck and chatted with this gentleman. And we started to get to know each other. And for the next four years of my life, until he passed away, I would stop and see him. I brought him home for dinner once. The thing that was interesting about this man is he was so proud of how far our nation had come in 1975. Because he remembers getting pulled out of bed by some people called Midnight Riders and chopped his arm off. But he loved. He was so proud of a nation that allowed him to own a home. He was so proud of a nation that allowed him to vote. And he always told me, and I was, it was, a, they were some scary stories, folks, especially for a little kid. I did not know the world existed like this. And the one thing I learned from him was, be mindful of where you come from, but remember, you always have more to do. And it was funny to me, when I decided to run for office, my mom told me, you know, she was glad that all these experiences that I hated, because I hated that town, with all my fiber of all my being, I wanted to leave the South. And I wanted to come back to the West. In fact, when I had an opportunity, my parents loved me enough to let me leave in high school so I didn't have to be there anymore to watch what I thought were social injustices. But when I ran for office, my mom told me all those experiences that I had gathered are going to make me who I am today. And that I need to learn from that. And Dr. King was part of those experiences because it was his speech that motivated her to go into that town and change the way it ran, no matter what, and to overcome it. And Mr. Speaker, you remember my mom would come to the legislature before she passed away about five years ago, and she would do her prayer and she, would, she loved this place. And she believed so much in democracy. And so did Dr. King. And they believed so much in love and peace. But yet we seem so far away from where we were. But we know that we've accomplished a lot. So don't lose hope. Don't lose heart. Don't focus on the negative that we see every day. Focus on the positive. The upcoming leaders that I saw before me today Give me the gift of freedom and the bravery to stand up and talk today. And also find patience for one another and try to know that we all are in this together and I know that we can have good resolution. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question before the House is, is the adoption of House Resolution 4653. As many as are in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The resolution is adopted. The speaker is pleased to introduce Rakshi Marshan, who was recognized by House Resolution 4652. Will she please stand and be recognized? She's in the North Gallery. Speaker is also pleased to recognize from the Yakima Nations Chairman Joe Gowdy and Legislative Chair from the Yakima Nations, Delane Sulkin. Will they please stand and be recognized? <laughs> the gentleman from the 37th District Representative Pettigrew. 
Representative Graves. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. With uh, with your indulgence, I'll uh, say that we heard from our, our our students this morning about how we should sit with people who aren't always like us. And so myself and my good friend from the 6th District decided to switch seats for the speeches this morning. And I am now reliably informed that the Democrats, who I am not one, will be caucusing. <laughs> The gentleman from the third district, Representative Rochelle. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and rising to, to to thank the gentleman for his speech. And uh, we'll try to do a little more lunch swapping in, in our members' cafeteria. And with that, I, I believe the Republicans will be caucusing as well. The House will be at ease for caucus.